Zeke, thank you so much for that. And you might want to stay up here because I, um, I need a helper or five in just a moment. Um, but let's close our eyes and pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you that in the Bible you have revealed yourself to us and you speak to us day by day. We pray that you would speak to us this morning, transform our hearts so that they would become more like your heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, my name's Dave. I'm one of the other vicars here. And um, I'm going to start by asking five people to come and stand with me. Um, I need your help. If you need some incentive, I've got a bag of mini eggs here. <laughs> Whoa, look at that. That's amazing. Okay, so we want one, two, three, four, five. I've got mini eggs here, and I counted them up um, before I came here, and I know there are 20. There are 20 mini eggs. So I'm going to give... I'm going to give them out between you. So I'm going to give one, two, three, four. There you go, Daniel. Four for you. I'm going to give um, some to you, Zeke, because you did that reading so well. There's a three for you. <laughs> I'm going to give um, some to, um, let me see, Toby. There you go. There's three for you. I'm going to give some to um, Thomas. There you go, there's a one for you. And that means, James, you get all the rest. That's nine. What? Nine to you. Now, I just want to interview you all quickly. Um, let's have a thing. Who was first? Dan, how does it feel to have four eggs? Um, it feels good, because I'm one of the highest. So. OK, it feels good. How does it feel to have three? Annoyed. Um, I did better off than Tom, so happy. <laughs> okay, Thomas, how are you feeling? I'm going to kill you. <laughs> okay, there's a bit of family love going on there. And uh, James, how do you feel? Rich. Rich, rich. Do you know this is how the wealth is distributed in our country? The poorest 20% have 1 20th of the wealth. The richest 20% have 90% of the wealth. And do you know, if this was the world, if I had um, 100 mini eggs and 100 people, let me just check my notes, make sure I get this right. If this was the world, do you know how many mini eggs, 100 mini eggs and 100 people, how many mini eggs do you think the richest one would get? 100? No, not 100, because that would mean they had all the wealth in the world. Uh, I'd say 87. 87. Oh, I think this has gone. Do you know the answer is 50? 50 mini eggs to one person. That's the way wealth is distributed around our world. Isn't that a bit shocking? And this is just our country here. So let's just um, maybe bear that in mind as these boys go and munch their mini eggs. I'm going to leave it to you to decide. Well, hang on. Okay, come back here. Come back here. Let's just do a little um, impromptu bit. Let's just do a little impromptu bit. The inequality of wealth distribution here amongst these five boys is leading to violence. <laughs> what does that tell us? James, you are in a very responsible position because you have been given more through no choice of your own, through no merit of your own. You have been given more than all the other boys and you can decide. I'm not going to make you. You can decide what you're going to do with it. And I can tell you that if you scoff them all yourself, you are doing what almost everyone in this country does all the time but I'm going to leave it up to you, boys. I'm going to suggest that, um, that you stay in the building here <laughs> so that you don't get taken out behind, uh, behind the bike sheds or whatever the church equivalent is and duffed up for your mini eggs. Um, but thank you very much. Shall we give them a round of applause? I once did that exercise in one of our church schools with a packet of chocolate digestives and 320 children. And the staff call it the Lord of the Flies assembly. <laughs> and they still talk about it now. I know there are a couple of staff members here who could probably tell you what complete chaos it was. The head teacher had to step in and restore order. We are all very good, aren't we? It may not be mini eggs. Um, we can smile about it when it's mini eggs. But when it's money, we're all very good, aren't we, at looking what other people have got and how much we have got. Did, if you've been on the BBC website this week, you may have played the little game that I played. How long would it take you to earn 
on your current salary what Cristiano Ronaldo earns. Has anyone done that? Well, some of you can go and reverse engineer it to work out how much I earn. It would take me 755 years of working as a vicar to earn what he earns in one year. And isn't it true that we are all very good at looking up the scale like that? But I then, feeling a bit, um, well, if I'm honest, because I knew I was going to have to talk about it this Sunday, I went and thought, right, if I look down the scale, there are um, over half a billion people on this planet living on less than one dollar a day. How long would they have to work earning one dollar a day to earn what I earn as a vicar in the Church of England? Do you know the answer? Over a century. Sorry, Toby, you might have done that, so you might have known. Um, over a century. There are, a lot, there are half a billion people on this planet who would have to work at their current rate of income for over a century to earn what I earn. We are very good at comparing what others earn. If you're interested, if you earn more than £35,000, you're in the top 40% of people in this country. If your annual income is over £62,000, your name is James, and you have nine mini eggs. <laughs> now, I'm making a game about this, but I'm hoping that, like me, this really actually bothers you. It bothers you that you live in a world where the richest 1% control half the wealth on the planet. It bothers you that there is this inequality and that our society is so bad at doing anything about it. And the other reason I really hope it bothers you is that it really bothers God. It really bothers God. You know, God has given us this incredible place to live, more than enough food for everyone, more than enough um, wealth, more than enough shelter, more than enough of everything, and yet half a billion people on this planet live on less than a dollar a day. How do I know it really matters God? Because all the way through the Bible, we find out that it bothers God. This is Isaiah 58, perhaps you've been reading it, speaking to religious people. Is this not the kind of fasting I have chosen, to loose the chains of injustice, to untie the cords of the yoke, and to set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter when you see the naked to clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood? And if you do this, God says, then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and he will say, here I am. See, the point of what I'm saying this morning is not to make everyone feel guilty and think, oh yes, I should be doing something about that. It's to say that God himself is longing to bless us, to be very near to us, to answer our prayers, to let our light shine through the whole world. But because he really, really cares about the poor, he connects the two things together. Jesus did the same. This is Jesus speaking the first words of his first sermon in public. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me. Why? To proclaim good news to the poor. It's not just that the uh, prostitutes and the lepers happened to be the people Jesus bumped into. No, he went out to find them. Do you know, if Jesus came to Marlow, he wouldn't visit all saints. He'd probably go down the cross keys on a Friday night. God has this bias towards the poor. He's always seeking out the people who have one mini egg. God loves the poor. 1 John 3, this is a, a letter in the end of the New Testament. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? How can the love of God be in that person? Aren't those strong words? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. And that tells me, and hopefully tells you straight away, that whatever, we, um, whatever I speak about in these few minutes, it doesn't really matter. What matters is what we do when we get home today. What actions we take. I think it's no exaggeration to say the easiest way to get on the wrong side of God is to abuse and hoard your wealth. 
Some people might take issue with that. I'd be happy to debate it. Um, it could be arguable, but if you take the sweep of the Bible, the easiest way to get on the wrong side of God is to hoard your wealth and oppress the poor. The reason we do this is because all of us have a default setting, and our default setting is called self. Our default setting is we want to eat the mini eggs. We don't want to share them because then we can't taste them ourselves. We'd rather have the nice taste in our mouths than in someone else's. Isn't that true? We're all twisted in on our own needs. It's what the Bible calls sin. We all instinctively think of ourselves first. And this is what God and what Jesus came to rescue us from. And this is the situation we find in Nehemiah chapter 5. Where... The wall is being built, and suddenly, the mini-eggs is happening. They're not sharing their stuff. Some are getting rich, the rich are getting richer, and the poor are getting poorer, and Nehemiah has to deal with it. And God has to deal with us, because there's no getting around it. Following Jesus hits our wallets and our purses. If you want to know where your heart is, how do you tell? Jesus said, it's very simple, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Why don't we go down the pub and take our bank statements with us and go, look, look at what I've spent this month. Does anyone do that? I don't. But Helen and I have done that with some friends, and I can tell you, it is like standing naked in front of a whole crowd of people. You think, oh my goodness, I'm making myself so vulnerable. Why? Because you're actually showing where your heart is. You're showing your heart to people. Look at your bank statement and you will discover, whether you like it or not, exactly where your heart is. You'll discover where your heart is, and also, if you look at your bank statements over time, you'll discover where your heart is going. Because there may be, um, I think there are lots of Christians who think, well, I've set up my direct debit, and so I'm I'm all right with God now, and that that I'll, I'll review it when I retire, or I'll review it every 10 years. The, The point is, Our heart is displayed in the way we use our money. And God wants our hearts to grow and change so they're more like him. So just as we might grow in height through our life, just as we might grow in knowledge or in wisdom or hopefully in maturity, so we should be growing in generosity all the way through our lives. Isn't that true? Who wants to be as generous when they're 70 as they were when they were seven? Tragically, for most people, I think it's the other way around and they're less generous. What I'm saying is God loves giving. Giving is good and exciting. And so I'm inviting us, myself most of all, on a journey of giving more and more and more and being more and more generous all the way through our lives. Nehemiah confronts these people who are charging, lending out of their plenty and charging interest, which is one of the best ways the rich oppress the poor because it makes them feel like they're doing good. And they are even... um, buying and selling in slavery, the children of their, um, of their kinsmen. And Nehemiah confronts them. Now, there's a whole sermon, which I'm not going to preach, about how he confronts them. It's fantastic. He is so angry about this. But if you read it, he, sa- he then says, after thinking it over, how many of us wish we always did that when we were angry? After thinking it over, he then doesn't go around and gossip around the whole of Jerusalem. He gathers together the people he's upset with, and he confronts them about it. And then he lets them respond. And actually, because he's got such a good point, they were silent and could not find a word to say. I accept that doesn't very often happen when we resolve conflict. But that did happen, and then together they worked out a solution. There we go, there's an outline of a sermon one of you can preach one day. So Nehemiah confronts them in a very godly and wise way, and he gives them three powerful motivations to change the way they're behaving. And I want to suggest these are three very powerful motivations for us as well. Here we are from Nehemiah 5. The first one... These aren't complicated, I'm warning you. The first one is this. The thing you are doing is not good. I mean, hands up if you think it's good what we're doing in this country, distributing our wealth in the way we've just seen. It's not good, is it? It's wrong. We need to do something about it. Come on. Come on. We need to do something. And I know it's so easy for all of us to say, well, what difference can I make with my tuppence hate me? Well, it's the, sand, it's the starfish throwing them back in the sea argument, isn't it? It's actually the, well, why can I bother being part of a church because I can't do anything? The church is the biggest grassroots movement the world has ever ever seen, and it is changing the world. We are capable of changing the world, but only if we all decide we're going to do something about it. 
The thing we're doing is not good. We need to do something about it. And the church at its best does. And believe me, when the church gets serious about dealing with poverty, nothing else comes close. Think about it. Caring for the dying. The hospice movement. The charities movement. You name it, Christians are out there doing something about all these inequalities. I spent four years um, in my 20s working for a charity in London. And one of the things we did was drive a van and I used to go out on this van sometimes, drive a van around London, collecting things from people who wanted to give them away, and then driving to someone who we could give them to. And, and I realized after kind of a few months of doing this, what we were doing was crisscrossing the fault lines in our society. We'd go from, Rit- we'd go from Fulham to somewhere else in London. I'm not gonna mention it because I'll probably offend you, but actually often in Fulham, we would just cross the road. London's like that, isn't it? It's a bit less like that in Marlow. Those of you who lived there, you know, you've got these multi-million houses with these big gates outside them. On the other side of the road, you've got a drugs den. And so we would, we would collect things, and it was amazing the way you'd see God work. We'd pack up in the morning, we'd go, okay, we've got a sofa, we've got some curtains, we've got some furniture to collect. We'd fill the van up, and they, they'd all like match each other, like all the woods would be the same color. And, the, and, and then we'd drive to this house, and sometimes I've been in houses where um, there is a, a a table, two chairs, um, a mum who's escaping domestic violence with her four children under the age of 10. And we open the door and she's like, I have nothing. You have a van full of furniture. And not only that, it all matches the table, which is my only piece of furniture. Incredible. This is what happens when you get close to the poor. You see God working in the most extraordinary ways. And I lost count of the times that we would leave people in tears. They just said, you have just doubled my possessions or more. And the church at its best crisscrosses these fault lines and sews back together what's torn apart in our society. This is what we're called to. I don't know if it excites you, but I tell you, it really, really excites me. The thing that you are doing is not good, but we are not powerless and we can do something about it. Here's the second reason, a powerful motivation to change our behavior. Should you not, Nehemiah says, this is verse 9 as well, should you not walk in the fear of our God? As I mentioned earlier, the easiest way, I think, to get on the wrong side of God is to hoard your wealth and oppress the poor. Does that bother you? Maybe some of you are sitting there thinking, well, not really, everyone else is doing it. Should you not live in the fear of God? Now, I know it's not very fashionable to talk about the fear of God, but here's the way I think about it, because some people will think maybe you've had an abusive parent, and you think the fear of someone in authority is a very scary thing for me. Um, I love sailing. I love the sea. And for me, the sea is the most wonderful playground imaginable. And, um, you know, if I'm sitting there drinking a cup of coffee, gazing out the window, my mind will often go to, you know, I wish I was sailing out in the sea and in the waves with the water splashing and the blue sky and the, you know, so wonderful. But I can tell you, you don't have to sail on the sea for very long before you learn to respect and fear the sea. And there are some days you just don't want to go out to sea because you'll die. You learn to fear it. And actually, I love standing on the safety of the beach and seeing these waves that are, you know, as high as these pillars coming into land and smashing on the beach. There's something awesome and beautiful about it. And I think God is a little bit like that. You know, God is not a doll that we get out of our pockets and makes us feel warm inside. God is not like a a pussycat that we can stroke and pet and then put back in his box. He's like a tiger. You know, when you're, when you're loose with God, it's a wonderful thing that he's friends with you, but you do want to be careful not to get on the wrong side of him, just like you want to be careful not to step on a tiger's tail. Now, I'm, I haven't got time to do a whole sermon on the, on the fear of God and the wrath of God, but I do want to say it's my job, I feel it is my duty to say to you, please fear God. Don't get on the wrong side of God, because he is more powerful than we can possibly imagine. And I want to say to you, before you die, do think about how you're going to give account of your life, because God will ask us for an account of our life, not in order to crush us, but because he cares about the poor, and there is going to be a judgment and an accounting. Now, for those of us who have come to God in humility and asked him to forgive us our sin, he forgives us. And we walk free, and we have nothing to fear. 
But just because we don't have anything to fear in approaching God doesn't mean we shouldn't fear God. Does that make sense? I know that sounds tautologous. And the way we use our wealth is really important to consider in the light of a right fear of God. Third powerful motivation. Give, Nehemiah says, restore it to them this very day. Do you know, it's not that hard to find someone who has fewer mini eggs than you. There will be, I I have always prayed that one day I would be in a church where no one leaves church hungry. I am willing to bet there is someone here this morning who is not sure where all their food is going to come from this week. You may be sharing a pew with someone who is desperately worried about their finances. And I would love to find a way, I'm not going to try and do it in 30 seconds now, I would love to find a way for us as a church to be able to fix that so there are no needy people among us. But you don't have to go far from here. We've heard about the homeless connection, the one can trust. We have a bin inside the door for people who can't afford to eat. Why not bring some food when you come to church and put it in that bin? They would come and empty it twice a week if we could fill it fast enough. And sometimes we do, which makes my heart sing. Peter West, who some of you will know. Um, Jenny, his wife, is, is here. He's the tall chap who often wears a bow tie. He isn't in church this morning because he is meeting in London with a group of people who are trying to encourage people to give away tens of millions of pounds. He um, helps run an organisation called The Bread Tin. You can Google it, which is a way of helping people to give away their money in ways that makes the maximum difference. Why don't we get behind Peter? And if you're in a position to do that, Google it, thebreadtin.org and get involved in the joy of giving. In a few weeks' time, Helen, my wife and I, are being taken to India by a charity. We're going to Kolkata, and we're going to spend four days looking around some of the poorest areas um, in Kolkata and just outside, with a view to helping us in this team of churches partner with a church out there to raise families out of poverty. Wouldn't it be amazing if in a year's time I could stand here and say, do you know, there are 50 families out in India who are no longer starving to death because of us. That might be happening. We'll let you know when we report back. One of the easiest ways and one way the Bible tells us to give is to support our local church. We spend a lot of time and energy in this church supporting people in need. And so I invite you, if you're not already, to contribute to the work of this church, not because I'm standing here saying we're desperately in need of money, but because the more we have, the more we can do about the mini eggs problem. Maybe you give already, which is fantastic. Maybe you could use the blue envelopes so that we can gift aid. Maybe you could use the standing order sheets, which are on the table at the back of church, so that you don't forget to give, but that it becomes a lifestyle. Week by week by week, you know you are giving and supporting the work of this church. I invite you to do it for these three reasons. Nehemiah finished by getting them to stand up and make a public response. You might remember from what Zeke said. They said, we'll do everything um, as you promised. So he got them to stand up in public and say, we are going to do this. And then all the assembly said, amen, and praised the Lord. And the people did as they had promised. Now, I know from my own sinful soul how easy it is to sit through a talk like this and think, oh yeah, I'm going to do something about that. And then you get about as far as the Georgian dragon afterwards and you think, oh my goodness, I'm late. And and we forget, don't we? So I'm not going to um, hold up a load of standing order forms and get you to march out here and sign them, although I think that's the kind of thing Nehemiah was quite into. But I am, as I finish, going to invite you, if you'd like to, to stand simply as a public affirmation. I am going to go home and review the way I spend my money in the light of these things, in the light of the fact that inequality in our society is not good, in the light of the fear of God, and in the light of my resolve to give and do something about it. So I'm going to give, not very long because I'm running out of time, 10 seconds for you to stand up if you'd like to. Um, I'm going to close my eyes, and then I'm going to pray for us all. Almighty God, everything that we see is yours. 
and all that we have, we have been given, not through our own um, merits, but because of where we've been born and the gifts we've been given and the people we've met and the kindness of your mercy. We thank you that we live in such comfort and you have given us so much. And we acknowledge your love for the poor and we confess our sin in neglecting to be generous to them. And we resolve now to do something about this state of inequality that is not good. We resolve to live in the fear of knowing who you are and how powerful you are and that by your grace alone we can stand in your presence. And we resolve here and now to do something about all this. Help us in our weakness, fill us with your spirit and help us to grow, to be more generous than we could ever have imagined we'd become. In Jesus' name, amen.